Hello, everybody. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this EPC policy dialogue um, that is going to be discussing the outcome of Armenia's snap election that took place uh, a couple of days ago on 20th of June and what these elections and the result mean for Armenia um, and the region more broadly. Uh, and of course, Armenia's relations with other external partners, uh, including the EU uh, and the US. These elections were called by Nicole Pashinian in response to sustained opposition rallies and dissent within the state over his handling um, of the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war, which led to severe political instability in the country. Now, despite Pashinian being blamed for Armenia's defeat, his party won a landslide victory, taking, I think, around 54% of the vote I mean, I find this quite remarkable because in any other situation you would expect, you know, a prime minister that lost a war to be, you know, put in the bin of history. Um, but I think this tells us um, a lot about the other horses that were, that were actually in this uh, parliamentary race rather than Pashinian um, himself. So today we're going to be focusing on a number of different questions and issues. Um, first of all, very importantly, you know, is this political stability over and done with, or is it still there? Um, what will be the priorities of Pashinian um, and his new government? What does this mean for the implementation of the November 2020 uh, ceasefire agreement? How is this election viewed by Azerbaijan and Russia? Uh, and what are the priorities going forward now for relations with the European Union? Now, I'm really happy um, to be joined by three great experts today. I think we're really in for a treat um, because they all know Armenia, you know, inside out, and they are going to share their views on the election um, and what is going to come next. Um, first of all, I'm very happy uh, to be joined here today by Ambassador Andrea Wiktorin, who is head of the EU delegation uh, in Armenia. Uh, she's been in that post since 2019, um, but it's not her first time in Armenia. Um, she was there several years earlier as Germany's ambassador to the country, I think between 2007 and 2009. Um, so she knows this country very well and has obviously seen a lot of changes there over the years. Um, secondly, Richard uh, Girigorzian, who I'm guessing is a very familiar face uh, to many of you, who is director of the Regional Study Centre uh, in Yerevan. And last but certainly not least, another very familiar face who works on the Caucasus, uh, Lawrence uh, Broers, who is director of the South Caucasus program at Conciliation Resources. He has decades of experience, not only on Armenia, um, but on the entire region. Now, just before we start, um, I need to give a small reminder to the audience um, that questions can be put to the speakers either by using the hand icon uh, or by typing them in the Q&A box. I would really appreciate it if you could put these questions early on so that I can include them into the discussion. Um, and where possible, can you please um, try and keep them rather short and not you know, three or four paragraphs long, which is sometimes the case because that makes it rather difficult um, for me to actually read. So I'd like to, first of all, to uh, give the floor uh, to the ambassador um, to ask her to share her to share her views um, on how she has viewed the election. I mean, the election campaign, the ambiance, um, the actual process during the election um, and now the, the outcome. So I'll give the floor to you, first of all, ambassador. Thank you so much um, to start with a positive uh, let's say message uh, we think uh, that the election day and also the whole vote counting can be assessed uh, positively um, perhaps i should say that the eu delegation uh, had two teams under the odia uh, or ceo odia mission um, and uh, we uh, the colleagues went out into into the uh, uh, regions uh, and they had an overall really positive impression also by the professionalism and the transparency of the whole process. Uh, and I can say 
as we are always working as this Team Europe, uh, a lot of my colleagues um, from EU member states did the same. And I had this morning a meeting and all of them came really roughly with the same message. They, uh, they, they saw the process positive. Now, um, I think what we have seen over the campaigning period was quite uh, a broad range of uh, comments um, which, uh, which were polarizing, which were um, using, let's say, strong words to say it diplomatically, and uh, also taking certain symbols I would not expect to find in an election campaign. And this, and this was also mentioned by the, by the uh, OSCE, um, made really um, a policy focused debate on strategies, on visions for the future of this country, very difficult. So you had to go into certain programs, but if you followed um, certain speeches, um, you saw a more uh, personalized uh, debate. Uh, and I think this was said. Uh, I would have wished a little bit more of positive, forward-looking uh, campaigning, but we have a clear outcome. Uh, and uh, I think now we have to look forward. Our, our wish would be that we now uh, can really start a process of unifying, of reconciliation, because that's what this country urgently needs. And especially if you go to the regions, and I was uh, some day, uh, some weeks ago in Sunik, if you go to certain, let's say, remote areas, you see the needs of the population. Also with the insecurity of the Armenian Azeri border right now. So I think it is really important that we concentrate now um, uh, also to support Armenia and the institutions. And we made a statement, I think this made, made it quite clear that we want to continue our cooperation. And it is for us very important. And there I, I am convinced that this is possible with the new government to continue the reform process because we made progress in the field of reforms, in the field of judiciary anti-corruption. Perhaps not everything could be achieved what we wish, but um, we consider this cooperation very positive. And now let's say we see a way forward to continue exactly this reform course. And we are right now in a process of defining, let's say the cooperation for the next seven years. So uh, this is, is really important. It will be decisive how, let's say, uh, uh, the deputies in the parliament will now start a process. There is an ongoing discussion whether the Armenia Alliance means uh, the alliance of Dashnaks and uh, and Kocharyan's party, whether they will take their seats. Um, so, but as one of uh, uh, commentators uh, I, I respect very much said, with such a big difference, yeah, that uh, Pashinyan nearly got 30% more, I think this is now an interim period. And I really sincerely hope that uh, then there will be a more, let's say, constructive way of procedure. This would be needed for this country. And just to mention what it means for the European Union, as I said, I think now we see a way forward to continue what we are doing and we are strongly committed to support this country um, because I think this with all the small problems you had uh, in this election, um, they were, they were tackled professionally and I can say this is a way uh, forward uh, in democracy and also commitment to rule of law. Um, and this is what we appreciate. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this um, very um, focused um, overview. I would just like to follow up with um, a quick question um, just regarding the deputies returning to the parliament. Um, do you think there is a risk that we could end up with a similar situation that what happened um, in Georgia, where you'll have um, deputies that don't 
um, return to the parliament, which will, which will, let's say, con sort of continue um, the political instability uh, in the country. I mean, could we end up in a similar situation where, you know, Monsieur Michel has to come over to Yerevan um, to negotiate uh, as he did in Georgia? Well, uh, I think we cannot exclude. I still hope that there is a certain reasoning uh, that they will that they will in the end take their seats. So this is perhaps the optimistic view of a diplomat. Yes, there is naturally a certain danger, but you see, I think um, it will take a little bit time. But uh, the two parties that are now in the or that will come into opposition. Um, uh, this gives them a certain leverage to be in the parliament. So I hope that uh, that they will overcome it. We cannot totally exclude it. I, honestly, what are, we are doing now, we are checking what is happening and what would be the procedure. And I think right now, as far as I saw it from the from the statements of the uh, head of the Central Election Committee, they, they have to check themselves. So um, we will see. Um, uh, I have no indication, they are playing with this right now. So uh, we will see if they want uh, really to, to, to go for the Georgian scenario. Naturally, it would be difficult. Okay, then we come in and have to try to find a solution. But I hope in the end um, that they will take their seats. Um, they will, I'm sure, and this will take a certain while, they will ap appeal to the Constitutional Court. Um, but you see, they were out of Parliament in the last period, so it was more these uh, personal attacks on Facebook, which I, this is a problem in this country, if you ask me. Uh, too many things happen via Facebook, and then you cannot control your emotions and your language anymore. So I'm a great uh, supporter of the idea that certain things should not be handled by Facebook. But now they have an opportunity at least to be in the parliament. Um, and and uh, still, um, yes, we are mentally thinking that there could be such a scenario, but still I'm, I'm, I'm positive and optimistic. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'd now like to turn to you, Richard, because you're obviously on the ground uh, in Yerevan as well, um, to hear your insights on how you view uh, this outcome and what it means. And if you think we're going to see a more unified approach from all of the different parties, or will there still remain this, you know, instability? Um, do the losers, you know, Kocharian and all the others sort of accept perhaps that their days are done, that they need to step back? Um, and are we going to see actually some new blood coming through in, Ar in Armenia um, as well? Uh, and a second question would be, why did a significant part of the electorate not actually vote? Because, I mean, there was a huge number of Armenians that just stayed as ho at home. Well, thank you very much. And also thank you to the European Policy Center for such a consistent interest in developments in Armenia. Following the ambassador, I'm equally optimistic, but I'm going to be much less diplomatic in terms of looking at the election. First is the degree of preparation for what was widely expected and fortunately came true, was a genuinely free and fair pluralistic democratic election. This is a notable achievement. I also would like to stress the positive contribution to the electoral process by the United Nations, the European Union, and several European member states, which actually helped in terms of ensuring a positive environment for a truly free and fair election. However, in the campaign itself, we see a rather disappointing, distressing discourse. Uh, trading of allegations, vicious and vindictive language and rhetoric, which in many ways was a race to the bottom. And the ordinary Armenian voter actually deserves much better and much more from their politicians. And in this context, I was disappointed with the lack of any real competition of policy ideas. Instead, it was unfortunately a rather primitive personality contest. 
In terms of the outcome, however, the significance of this particular election should not be underestimated. We are and have been in uncharted political territory. This is the first ever election in Armenian history, given the unexpected loss of the war over Nagorno-Karabakh and the deep degree of polarization and political deadlock. But we see the government securing a fresh mandate and a renewal of a rare degree of legitimacy, which unfortunately is all too rare in this region. And at the same time, despite the post-war insecurity and uncertainty, which deepened the divide politically, we see a reassuring degree of resiliency of institutional democracy in Armenia. The lack of violence and the reassuring tendency of stability and resilience is also very positive to note. In other words, Armenia's democratic system survived, not just the political survival of Pashinyan. However, I would say as important as this free and fair election was, it wasn't enough. We need to do much more in order to address deeper deficiencies in governance. And this is why the post-election period is going to be as challenging as the election in terms of a need for compromise and consensus, for reconciliation nationally. And I am a little bit concerned for two reasons. The polarization will now enter the parliament. And I don't have much confidence in the ability of either the government or the opposition to forge a common ground. And second, Prime Minister Pashinyan with his fresh mandate is going to be dangerously tempted to engage in destructive and vindictive vendetta politics of retribution and revenge. This is something we need to encourage the government to avoid. And in conclusion, I think the low level of voter turnout was not much of a concern. It was still higher than the election in 2018, even during the enthusiasm of the so-called Velvet Revolution. What it is is natural, a reflection of disgust with the discourse in the campaign. And I do think we are challenged to elevate the discourse and to offer more of a competition of policy alternatives rather than this rather vindictive, albeit temporary, post-war political debate. But going forward, I remain justifiably optimistic, given the resilience of institutional democracy. Thank you, Richard. I think it's uh, the, the culture of vendetta and revenge um, is not unique just to Armenia, I think, unfortunately, it's something that, you know, plagues this um, entire region and will probably take some, some while to, um, to, to shake off. Um, but I'd like now to move to you, to you Lawrence, um, to give you a chance to offer your perspectives on how you see this election. And perhaps you could elaborate a bit on the context and backdrop in which these elections actually took place, which was quite, quite unique, if I can put it that way. Thank you, Amanda, and, and thanks to the European Policy Centre for, for organising this, this event. Um, yes, I mean, I, I very much agree with the preceding speakers. Um, I think it is Armenia's battered institutions that are the real winner uh, in this election, rather than any of the, the political forces actually uh, contesting it. Um, I mean, the backdrop to this election, uh, obviously, um, I think the story begins with the 2018 Velvet Revolution. Uh, a non-violent civic uprising that embedded a, a culture uh, of, of civil resistance uh, to a post-Soviet authoritarian governance. Um, was consolidated in December 2018 when the Civil Contract Party won a 70% landslide victory. Uh, and then we saw last year's Second Karabakh War, an absolutely devastating uh, defeat and Nikol Pashinyan uh, having no choice but to sign an agreement that many in Armenia uh, saw as a, a capitulation. Uh, so, you know, the protests against his rule started after that. 
I actually think that Armenia uh, dodged a bullet uh, by rejecting uh, an option that was put forward by uh, a Homeland Salvation Front to uh, transfer the government uh, to a kind of a technocratic interim uh, uh, government. Um, uh, I think that was the opposition also playing for time. Uh, I think you know, what's extraordinary in a sense is that the opposition has known how unpopular it is. Uh, so by, by did for time, uh, bringing us uh, into 2021, and then I think the, the straw that broke the camel's back uh, was the confrontation uh, in February uh, with the army. Uh, there was a, a kind of a showdown of public recriminations over responsibility uh, for the defeat um, uh, that led to 40 senior officers writing an open letter uh, expressing their lack of confidence in Nikol Pashinyan's leadership. And it was in the negotiations after that uh, that he conceded uh, the, uh, the election. Um, so we've got this paradox uh, that we need to explain. Uh, how did uh, a government that oversaw uh, such a devastating defeat win so convincingly uh, just a few months later? Uh, and so in that context, I think this is a very surprising outcome. Uh, but in the broader context of, regime, of, of Armenia's post-Soviet regime trajectory, I don't actually think it's, it's that surprising. Uh, until 2018, uh, Armenia was a, a competitive authoritarian regime, uh, one that had all the formal trappings uh, of a democracy, uh, but not a, a level uh, playing field. And there are a number of features, I think, which we need to uh, bear in mind when we think about uh, Armenia's regime politics. Uh, first of all, a very high degree of elite factionalism. Uh, you don't have a united uh, political elite uh, in Armenia sustained by uh, resource rents uh, and patronage. So there's always been a very intense degree of competition. Most uh, or many of Armenia's post-Soviet elections have actually been uh, intensely uh, contested. Uh, secondly, uh, there has been a vibrant civil society uh, throughout the post-Soviet period. Armenia's civil society is, is much broader and wider than simply a Western-funded uh, kind of neoliberal conception uh, of civil society. It's rooted in diasporic networks uh, and uh, in a very high degree historically uh, of civil society activity and, and non-state actors. Um, and a third feature is the use of coercion. Uh, at specific moments in order to basically to, uh, to flatten uh, the political playing field. And we think of the suppression of post-electoral protest uh, in 1996, the dispersal of protests in 2004, and most infamously, uh, the uh, dispersal uh, and killing of 10 people um, after elections in March 2008 that, that is very powerfully associated uh, with Robert Kocharyan. Uh, the, the, the principal op oppositional contender in these elections. Um, and so um, what, we, what we have in effect is a kind of uh, uh, regime context that doesn't really support uh, sustained, stable uh, authoritarian uh, rule. Um, and I think you know, in, in this particular election, the fact that it was the formers uh, I know that Richard has uh, memorably referred to this election as the Jurassic Park contest. Uh, the fact that we had all three uh, of uh, Armenia's uh, former presidents uh, contesting this election preserved that velvet revolution polarity between new and old elites. And when we think about Robert Kocharyan as the, uh, the emergent front runner, let's not forget that Robert Kocharyan had never won uh, a presidential election uh, in the first round. Uh, in 1998, he won just 38.5% uh, of the vote in the first round. Uh, five years later, um, it was, uh, I think, 49.5% uh, that he won in the first round. Uh, in other words, he was only able to win these elections, uh, presidential elections in the past, uh, in a second round and in a vote that was deemed uh, flawed. Uh, by international uh, observers. Uh, so in that sense, you know, I, I, I do subscribe to the view that this is not perhaps so much uh, a, a resounding mandate for Nikol Pashinyan as a resounding rejection uh, of his uh, predecessors. Um, but I, I share with the other speakers uh, a, a similar concern. I think the problem now, and well, one of the many challenges, uh, is the risk of dominant power politics. Uh, you've got a ruling party. Uh, I think it will be able to avoid parliamentary gridlock because it has a majority. 
uh, can effectively rule uh, without the other MPs being in the room. Uh, it can uh, uh, orchestrate a quorum. Um, and so I think there will be a temptation now to engage in dominant power politics. And you know, we'll end up uh, quite likely, I think, with a similar kind of polarized domestic politics um, as we've seen uh, next door uh, in Georgia. So I think the key test now for Nicole Pashinyan and for civil contract is whether they can rebuild that broad coalition uh, that brought them to power uh, in the Velvet Revolution. And that includes uh, uh, rebuilding bridges uh, with civil society, rebuilding bridges with the military, and rebuilding bridges, I think, in uh, first foremost, very urgently, uh, with the country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which has been stricken uh, without leadership uh, since the resignation of the minister and all of his deputies uh, just uh, at the end of last month. So um, I, I do share, you know, a, a generally kind of positive uh, overview uh, of this election, but I think we are going to see uh, ongoing instability, polarized domestic politics, uh, an ongoing contest between islands of reform uh, and authoritarian reserves. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, Lawrence. I would now like to give the floor back to um, the ambassador to perhaps follow up on some of the points uh, that you've made, um, particularly related to perhaps this, you know, increase in dominant power politics. Um, I mean, it sounded to me as if we could see a sort of back possible backtracking um, on some of the things that were achieved by Prime Minister Pashinian, you know, during his first term in office, and many of the commitments that he made back during that period to strengthen Armenian democracy, getting rid of corruption, the rule of law, uh, and all of those things. Uh, and linked to that, back in the day, he was you know, committed to strengthening ties with the European Union as a partner to help Armenia on this journey. Um, so I would like to hear your, um, your interpretation um, of this ambassador. I mean, do you see that's a risk? I mean, does the EU still have enough leverage on Armenia? If they had leverage in the first place um, to, to, commit, to make them sort of commit, if you want to put it that way, to having a more unified um, or having a more more culture of pragmatic politics um, or not, um, and then we'll then we'll move to the topic of Russia. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would join uh, the assessment that uh, you have, and this is the development of the last years, a vibrant civil society. And by the way, in our assistance, we gave we supported the UNDP basket project, but we also gave let's say, quite considerable uh, 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 funding to civil society organizations to have uh, independent uh, observation. And we will continue to work on this process. Um, and yes, it was, uh, let's say, uh, a, a decision between, let's say, the ancien regime. Um, I liked, but this is due to the fact that I was before in Belarus, um, the uh, the comparison um, Eric Kopian uh, chose to say Kocharyan wants Belarus with apricots. So as I know what is happening in Belarus, I don't want to have Armenia a similar fate. Um, I don't say it's easy now. Uh, I, I also see uh, if, you, if you win with such a rhetoric and the hammer, uh, you have now to come back and, 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 and change the attitude. And I think in the same time, I may be wrong, this is also the end of the revolution. And now we should enter into a phase where we have a government um, uh, where, where he sees that he is elected twice. So I hope this opens a certain confidence also to take experts on board in the government. Um, we have seen good examples. Also for me, the Ministry of Justice is, for, for example, a pillar of, of cooperation. Um, and you have others where you would wish a more proactive stance, I put it like that. Um, you see, the European Union is not asking the partners to make a choice. As we are not saying either cooperation with EU or 
with Russia. And I think often, um, let's say, uh, we, we met a certain mistrust and we were not believed. But I think that we really uh, have shown that we are a reliable partner. So we have a fact, Russia is in this country, but we can offer, let's say, really support on eye level and expertise. And I think the best we offer is that we have um, the member states on board. I think the development also in the last year to, due to COVID strengthens the idea of a Team Europe approach, means it is the EU plus the member states. And therefore, certain um, programs are especially successful if they are taken positively, is for example, twinning where you really get uh, peer experts from member states. So um, we will, uh, I got all the confirmation what it is worth, but I believe in it, um, before the elections that there is a willingness to continue the reform cause. So there I have a much uh, confidence that we will do this. And uh, you see the government continued to work a little bit uh, distracted, I would say, in the last weeks, understandable. But for example, they, they finalized the, the, the new roadmap, also the additional part of the roadmap after SEPA entered into force. So there is a commitment to continue uh, this reform course. It could be structured a little bit, uh, let's say, more energetically now after the elections. And um, it will be decisive that you really understand that you have to take the society on board. Um, I think one of the uh, comments Kotarian made that he will look into all the Soros funded uh, uh, organizations uh, led to quite an outcry and they came naturally to the international community. Um, but there I, I am confident that we that we see a more positive approach. And I want to underline one thing which was not mentioned, um, although they got a criticism at the end now that uh, he was more criticizing Pashinyan than others. But we have really seen in this last year the, the, the uh, strength of the, in, the institution of the Ombudsman, who really uh, raised certain issues which are important um, really to, to develop uh, democratic structures. And he also made the link, which was not directly understand, uh, understood nor liked by the government, that security is also an issue of human rights for the people living at, in the border region. So um, I think these are, are strengths of the institutions. And um, I, I uh, think that there is a willingness and I compared the programs. Let's say um, in the Armenia Alliance, you have one little paragraph and we come UN, uh, uh, CIS, CSTO, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Council of Europe, uh, and EU. So, you see, I didn't see there really a vision how to develop um, the, the relationship with the European Union. I see it on the side of, of the uh, civil contract, but I agree. And um, what was said both by Richard and, and Lawrence, um, we will take it up. Um, I think as soon as we have the government, uh, um, I think we will, we will, if we see that there is a, a certain danger, um, we will uh, tackle it directly. But I'm confident that, um, uh, we want really to support this country, and you have to see. Um, it was it was also very difficult for the for the people, and therefore we need now, um, let's say, a positive approach to give them uh, a future. Uh, and this is social economic recovery and reforms. These are the two elements in order to make this country resilient. Thank you, um, Ambassador. Um, and I'll follow up now with, with, with you, Richard. 
Um, I mean, it, how I mean, how do you see now? I mean, how is the perception of the EU now in Armenia? I mean, against the backdrop um, of the war, I mean, has it changed? You know, also, do you see a, a strong commitment, as the ambassador was talking about, to continue um, with these crucial re uh, reforms? Uh, and just to pick up on one of the questions in the chat box um, that came from Nareg Terizian, who's asking about the steel mandate. I mean, what does it actually mean? I mean, Pashinian said he's moving from a velvet mandate to a steel mandate. Um, but in real terms, what actually is this steel mandate? Well, let me start with one of the many difficult questions you give me and start with the last one from Nadek Terzian. Uh, in terms of the rhetoric, uh, which worries me, Prime Minister Pashinyan has now openly threatened to transform the so-called Velvet Revolution into whatever he means by a steel revolution. And to be honest, I'm worried because I do expect the new government of Pashinyan to target institutions. The first and foremost will be the judiciary as a legacy institution from the old system, but it's clear that legal reform and uh, reconstituting the judiciary is very much a priority for the prime minister. And at the same time, as he's already said, the prime minister will purge or cleanse many ministries and civil service. And I do think this is very important in terms of the danger of cutting corners. This has to be a rule of law, legislative and regulatory based process implemented in a very neutral way. It cannot be an instrument for retribution. But I also think the Armenian church and the Armenian diaspora will have to uh, call, be called to account by the government. I do expect both to be targeted after a very toxic campaign. Right or wrong is not the issue. It's how this plays out that's a test. And anti-corruption. I'm concerned that anti-corruption as a policy effort has slowed down and is rather dangerously arbitrary and selective. And in terms of looking at imperiled reform, from a perspective of the European Union, I'm both worried but also reassured. On the one hand, there is a unique second chance Armenia was afforded a second chance from the European Union in restoring relations through the Comprehensive and Enhanced Partnership Agreement, SEPA, after we were forced to sacrifice the association agreement under the old government. This was a valuable, rare second chance. I also think, think that the European Union now has a rare second chance to repair its relations with Armenia after the perception in the post-war environment of Western neglect. And what's most important is a distressing precedent from the war over Nagorno-Karabakh, a dangerous precedent that seems to vindicate the use of force for essentially a diplomatic conflict and a victory of authoritarian countries over democratic Armenia, which undermines the seductive appeal and attraction of European values and faith in democracy. The burden in Armenian civil society on us is to challenge that narrative and reassure that we do require greater confidence and faith in democracy and democratic institutions as a component of national security. It is not one or the other. And in this context, I'm optimistic. At the same time, I do have higher expectations on the prime minister than before. An early election, we often forget, was not automatic. It was a prudent response to an underlying political uh, challenge and deadlock. But now we need to build upon that. And I do know in the past several hours, according to my information, the opposition internally has decided to assume the mandates and take the seats. 
It's not announced publicly, but this is a gesture and hopefully an opportunity to begin working to transform political disagreements and confrontation to well within the parameters of what's normal, legal, and expected within a parliamentary and political framework. Thank you, Richard. And that sounds like that like very good news and a sign of, you know, political maturity, you know, for the good of the people being shown in Armenia. So this is I'm not sure it's maturity, this, but I hope this it is, could this be is desperation. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um now, Lawrence, I, I would like to turn to you to focus a bit on a bit on the neighborhood, um, starting with, with Azerbaijan. You know, I would be interested to hear your insights on how you think that Azerbaijanis um, view this result. Um, and we have a question here as well, again from Mr. Uh, Terzian, um, who a question to you, Lawrence, uh, who's pointing out, or he's saying that Azerbaijan intensified its military and diplomatic provocations ahead of the elections, significantly adding to an already stressful campaign. Uh, do you expect Azerbaijan's attitude to change now that the elections um, or over. I mean, did they really do that, or would they have done those things anyway, even if there wasn't an election campaign? Um, I give the floor to you. Well, the, that's right, Amanda. There's been this ongoing kind of uh, conflict calendar of events ongoing in parallel uh, to this snap election. Um, we've got various uh, post war kind of hangover issues um, lingering uh, from, uh, from last year's war. Um, the priority issues on the Armenian side are the uh, continued uh, retention of prisoners uh, uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, on the Azerbaijani side, uh, the priority is uh, the minefields uh, and the receipt of uh, maps of these minefields uh, from the Armenian side, which would facilitate uh, the process of rehabilitating and reconstructing uh, the deoccupied areas. Now, just shortly after uh, the campaign uh, was announced, or the election was announced, uh, this new series of incidents along the Armenia-Azerbaijan international border in Sunik and Gerhard Kunik uh, began with these incursions uh, by Azerbaijani forces reported uh, several kilometers uh, into uh, de jure uh, Armenian territory. And I think a lot of people saw that as a kind of an effort uh, to influence uh, the election. Um, that presupposes that such events wouldn't have happened anyway. Insofar as they related to the election, I think they may have been a kind of uh, insurance against the Pashinyan uh, defeat, uh, giving Azerbaijan uh, a range of new positions around which to then uh, uh, enter into uh, further dialogue and negotiations. So I guess one of the issues now is, will, as, as the question from uh, Mr. Terzian asks, uh, will, uh, the temperature and, and will the atmosphere uh, improve? Um, I think that sort of um, begs the question of how responsive the policy process is uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, there has been basically a policy of maximum pressure uh, on Armenia. Um, Baku has been pressing uh, its advantage, uh, which I think is you know, to be expected um, and, and it's not really surprising. Um, and, but I think what this election result uh, suggests is a certain resolution uh, of this internal contest within Armenia over the vision of Armenia for the future. Uh, if we think back to the 1990s, the vision of Armenia put forward by Levantel Petrosyan was for a compliant Armenia, an Armenia that settled uh, its geopolitics and uh, released itself from the geopolitics of eternal friends and enemies. And countering that um, was the vision, if you will, put forward by Robert Korcharian uh, of an augmented Armenia that encompassed and in incorporated not only Nagorno-Karabakh, but also the surrounding uh, occupied territories. Um, so I think you know, that, that contest was still uh, uh, very much uh, ongoing until last year. This election, I think, is uh, a, a firm step towards uh, a compliant Armenia and towards the priority of building a constitutional state in Armenia rather than building a garrison state uh, focused on national security threats. So the issue is uh, what kind of Armenia or which of these two Armenias does Azerbaijan uh, want to deal with? 
So I think um, there may be some reduction of the maximum pressure uh, uh, strategy, uh, but I think we will continue to see Azerbaijan uh, focused on an illiberal concept uh, of peace. Uh, so one that is consistent with its own regime type, uh, one that aims in a number of different fields uh, to, uh, to control um, and to direct uh, the peace process uh, in ways that reinforce the existing power hierarchy in Azerbaijan. Uh, so that means on the one hand, uh, a hegemonic discursive uh, framework, uh, focusing on the state as the exclusive legitimate actor in Azerbaijan. It means uh, securitizing access to Nagorno-Karabakh, controlling uh, the economic resources that can come into that space. Um, and I think perhaps that is uh, Azerbaijan's uh, uh, kind of entry point uh, for a relaxation uh, of its maximum pressure uh, policy, because on its own uh, to rehabilitate and reconstruct uh, all of these deoccupied areas and to create viable communities where people are actually going to want to live, first of all, requires enormous economic resources. And secondly, it requires work at the community level so that you've actually got you know, communities who are living in close proximity to one another who uh, can uh, transact, who can live side by side and who can interact. Um, so uh, overall, I don't expect uh, a, a great sort of, uh, a, 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 a very significant change, uh, but some relaxation of the maximum pressure tactics. Thank you, um, Lawrence. I would like to return to you now, um, Ambassador, um, to ask you, first of all, if you could perhaps elaborate a bit on what the EU has been doing um, in the post-war period in terms of, you know, peace, peace building, financial assistance and these and these things. Um, and if there's more that we can expect um, to come onto the horizon. And then my second question would be about the changing geopolitical um, situation in the region. I mean, obviously, it seems to me that, you know, Russia um, now has a closer relationship with Armenia than ever before, but also the arrival of Turkey um, in a much bigger role into the region, obviously, um, with its, um, its mission on the ground, the role that it played in the conflict, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, you know, changes changes the, the dynamic. Um, so I'd be interested to see how, how, how you or how the EU actually views this um, and whether you view there's any sort of space um, for a, perhaps a greater level of cooperation or engagement um, specifically with Turkey that is a NATO member after all um, in the South Caucasus to the, to the, to, to the benefit of the, of the current situation or not. Well, on, on what we did, we have uh, to start, and this made it perhaps a little bit easier that we were very fast to offer support in the COVID situation. So we were going for economic resilience um, and, uh, and tried really to, to reach out to the vulnerable groups. And uh, we were very fast. I would say we, we were really the first to really come up with humanitarian assistance, uh, uh, even in the end of the war and then in, in the face, uh, really supporting, um, supporting vulnerable groups and displaced persons from Karabakh. Um, and we understand that now we have to shift the whole thing a little bit. So we had roughly, four, we always say in and around Karabakh, which means Azerbaijan, Armenia, and, and uh, uh, Karabakh itself, where we are active, and this I underline because I sometimes get this criticism from the Armenian side, the international uh, community uh, forgot Karabakh. This is not true, but not to end up in this politicized discussion about the access, we go via the ECRC because the ECRC has a mandate to go there. So we do things there. We have uh, so far um, uh, uh, offered uh, 6.9 million euros. We are now working on a new program on 10 million. Um, and we got rather early the request by the Armenian government that we go south. So we will, um, we will uh, see what we can do uh, in a general 
um, uh, way to stabilize the situation economically, but also really see the aspect that you need uh, social protection. And for us, Green Deal, it has to be green. And to see the opportunities um, if you would really develop uh, certain areas. So, um, and then uh, there will be a focus on the South, on SUNIC. That's one of the reasons why I went there, really to see what we can do to support uh, this Mars, um, both economically, but also in, in, in the field of peace building. And then we have quite uh, some regional programs which are having the, uh, the objective to bring people together, to have a sort of confidence building. In Armenia, you should not use the word peace building because uh, at least uh, uh, all partners I met tell, and I agree with them, the conflict is not yet over. So that's why I, I prefer to use the word confidence building. We have uh, a, a program which will start soon, which is called EU for Dialogue, um, where we uh, have different components um, to bring people together, but also to help in the economic field. We have a program EU for Culture, um, which again means uh, that we support uh, the two countries to develop uh, in smaller cities uh, cultural management. And there is the idea behind that one day one can really bring this together. And we have uh, a program run by um, by the EUSR team, who play a very important role, I would say, uh, which is called EU for Peace. So these are special uh, attempts to have confidence building. And if you ask me personally, I think we need to be patient. Um, and uh, I totally agree with Richard. Uh, yes, we had uh, we had a very high standing, let's say, last year in spring, and naturally the international community, but also the European use, Union, lost confidence during the war and shortly after this, with the understanding that we remain silent. This is not totally true, because uh, where we go via diplomatic uh, channels and try to reduce the tension or try to find solutions. I think we had a good example now with the release of these 15 uh, prisoners of war, uh, which was, uh, let's say, joint efforts of the Americans, but also of uh, President Michel and, uh, and the OSCE uh, 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 um, chairmanship uh, that was also involved in this. Is, Perhaps this can be developed further because I think we need a sort of mediation to overcome this conflict as a, uh, captives against maps, so to put it very bluntly. Um, and yes, I would also say that landmines are a, a, a serious concern and uh, normally we would ask everybody to sign the Ottawa Convention. So the European Union is a clear and strong supporter of the uh, OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs. Um, and we will continue these efforts. Um, however, you go into this broader, as a, we stand ready to help. And this, this we told both sides uh, on different levels, in different occasions, and Tovo Klam made, made uh, the visit to both, um, that we are willing to play a greater role. And um, we have to see now, after the elections, I'm, I'm sure there will be an opportunity to discuss what we can do. Um, however, uh, let's say, uh, I think Turkey is a factor one has to speak to. I think this was done uh, uh, on different levels again uh, via the European Union also to raise at least the question um, of uh, the Southern Caucasus. Um, uh, we, we try, uh, there is a constant contact, I should say, with Russia via the co-chairs. And uh, again, I have to, to quote Tolvo Kla, who is, uh, uh, he is also in contact with the Russian foreign ministry. So it is not that we are not speaking to each other, although the, uh, the, the, the relationship is not easy right now, I would say. Um, 
For the Armenians, and now I speak from their perspective, it will be very difficult to get Turkey on board. Because, um, and this is perhaps something what uh, has told me the foreign minister some time before he stepped down, that Armenia needs to develop a new identity or a new vision of the identity. So far, it is really concentrated on the genocide question and on the other hand, Karabakh. So um, at the moment, there is more a more self-confident uh, position and uh, let's say another um, idea of an identity, it will be easier. For the time being, I would say it is difficult. Um, and what we see here or what we observe, we have to see that there is uh, quite a lot of hate speech coming from different sources um, uh, directed against Armenians. And this is, makes it very difficult. By the way, we have a long going um, process in, uh, in the European Union. I remember I had the same when I was here as German ambassador, try to also again, uh, confidence building measures, bringing, uh, let's say, certain Turkish uh, think tankers to, and Richard knows it best, um, uh, together here with, with, the, uh, with, with the Armenians in order to really start to help to get to a, a reconciliation. But honestly, for Armenians, this is difficult. I don't say everything. I would I, sometimes it would be good one step forward, but um, we have to see the feelings of the people here. Thank you, um, Ambassador. I'd like to turn back to you now, now Richard, um, with a couple of questions. First of all, the one that's in the chat box um, that's asking how swift the government is going to form um, the new. Um, the new the new government uh, and also asking if there's any risk the new government uh, pursuing re-engagement with the IMF um, in pursuit of structural economic forms under the program is there any risk that under um, the that Pashinian's efforts to consolidate power he could forego much of this fiscal discipline needed um, in that respect uh, and the other question I would like to ask you is actually regarding the ceasefire agreement I mean to what extent um, is there going to be movement now to sort of fill some of the points um, that, that still remain to be filled, particularly in terms of these um, transit corridors, etc.? Um, is something going to happen rapidly or is there still going to be issues? Um, so the floor is yours. Well, I always love the easy questions you give me, but I'll try my best. Uh, first and foremost, the formation of the new government. I'll be honest, I have no idea because Pashinyan has no idea. In other words, this is going to be an extremely difficult challenge. And for Pashinyan and the new Armenian government, the real challenge is not the resignations of the ministers. It's the replacement of the ministers is the big challenge. For example, who becomes Armenia's foreign minister and deputy foreign ministers? I have no real list of viable, competent candidates, to be quite honest with you. And I'm concerned. I'm worried. The choice in the election, we had a very narrow selection of parties and politicians. In terms of serving in this new government, it's even less of a choice. Having said that, the good news, there seems to be serious consideration of forming a bigger tent cabinet more technocratic, perhaps bringing in political rivals, Adam Sarksyan, perhaps Edmund Marukyan, looking to the central bank for new talent from the technocrats. So there is an opportunity here in terms of a more neutral, less partisan, yet more of a cabinet based on meritocracy and competence, not based on loyalty individually. Now, in terms of a related question, I work closely with the International Monetary Fund in Armenia and headquarters. I'm very confident that this government, like previous governments, will only continue to work closely with the IMF and other international finance institutions. 
EBRD, Asian Development Bank, World Bank. Furthermore, there is a sense of opportunity in one key respect. The one bright spot of Armenian reform consistently for many years is the Armenian Central Bank has always been and continues to be genuinely independent and without political interference. Monetary policy is a rare, reliable area of policy. There are concerns about rising levels of public debt and in terms of even tax reform. These are concerns, but the bigger issue is anti-corruption and Armenia's need for a new model of economic growth, as well as a coming challenge that no Armenian government has been prepared for. The challenge of economic recovery from COVID-19 in terms of job creation and the right kinds of jobs, stimulus, etc. But moving to the ceasefire agreement, I want to use your words. It's important to note this was a Russian-imposed ceasefire agreement where in many ways Armenia had no choice but to accept in order to stop the war, save lives, and salvage what's left of the Karabakh. Having said that, it's an agreement over the cessation of hostilities. It's not a ceasefire agreement in terms of a lasting, durable ceasefire regime, nor is it a peace agreement. The imperative for everyone, including Azerbaijan, is a return to diplomacy and to negotiate the implementation of the terms as a starting point of that ceasefire agreement. The positive news is this. There is one area of progress and diplomatic engagement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's a working group on the restoration of trade and transport, head, headed by a former deputy prime minister of Armenia, who's likely to continue. We have also preparations of an agreement for a similar second working group to provide the legal institutional framework for border demarcation. And this is very important to preempt and prevent accidental miscalculation and border incursions. And in this context, Armenia is giving away to Russia control of its third external border with Azerbaijan. In return, a formal, more lasting, more secure border demarcation process. This is somewhat of a move that undermines Armenian independence and sovereignty, however. Having said that, what we also see is a need for the return of the Minsk group, which I think Russia will encourage as a way to legitimize what was a Russian unilateral military deployment. It's the opposite of Crimea and also European Union re-engagement, as well as American re-engagement. What this is for Russia is an opportunity for burden sharing, sharing of the responsibility of post-war stability operations. EU, American, Minsk Group, and under the Russian reality, based on a unilateral Russian deployment of peacekeepers. But this is a rare opportunity where Russia can work with and not against the West. And now we can give it back to Lawrence, my more uh, smarter uh, interlocutor. Okay, thank you, Richard. Actually, we passed, we passed the one hour of allotted time, um, which is unfortunate because we could continue this discussion for a very long time because there's many issues to elaborate on. Um, but I would just like to close by asking each of you um, if you could give the Armenian government or the new government, Mr. Pashinian, I should say, actually, one piece of advice now, what would it be? Maybe you want to start. Would you like to start, Lawrence? Uh, well, um, yeah, I guess I would focus on institutions, um, avoid uh, metaphors of steel revolutions. It reminds everyone of Stalin. That's not what we want. 
we want to see a return to the broad coalition. And it seems that that's what a majority of voters in Armenia uh, also want. Uh, this election was a resounding rejection of, of the post-Soviet phenomena of strong men, robber barons, uh, potentates, oligarchs. Uh, so uh, the key focus, I think, is on incremental institutional uh, improvements. Uh, that seems to me to be the way forward. Thank you. Ambassador, what would your advice be? Also, I have two advices. First, uh, concentrate on strategic communication. I think something that was really a problem and uh, created, uh, uh, let's say, more of this polarization before, before we entered into the election. And the second, more women are needed. I am, I, and I believe women were sidelined. Women, as of, if you looked at the government, were underrepresented, uh, and I believe, sorry, um, I think certain things would have developed differently had been there women in certain uh, institutions or having a say. Uh, so I would really uh, advise uh, to look, uh, and they have young, bright, talented women. So I hope uh, that there will be more uh, balance and more cooperation. Okay. Richard, final word to you. Well, it's what I tell them privately. There's a necessity and a need for a strategic vision. The lack of a diplomatic strategy, the lack of military reform is based on an absence of the end state objective. What kind of Armenia are we trying to build? No one has a vision or an explanation. And in this regard, Armenia is like an alcoholic who refuses to get treatment because he refuses to admit he has a problem. We're in a state of denial. We have to adjust to this new reality and basically uh, adapt and adopt appropriate policies. Anything less is not enough. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank all of you for joining me today. I have to say that I found this discussion really interesting. Um, it was great to hear a bit more about what's going on in Yerevan and what might happen uh, in the, the near to medium term, along with all of the other issues that, we, that we've discussed today. And as I said, I think we could have gone on for another couple of hours. You know, one hour certainly um, isn't enough. So thank you really for giving up your time um, today. Um, the European Policy Centre will be continuing to follow developments on this issue um, and other issues related to the South Caucasus. Um, just as a small advertisement, in a couple of weeks we have um, another event on Georgia. This time we'll be looking at, you know, how the implementation um, of the Michelle Agreement um, is going. So I hope the audience, thank you for joining us today, by the way, the audience, I hope you look out for that. Uh, and we'll also be marking the one, uh, the one anniversary um, of the war with another event related to Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, so also please um, keep tuned in, look out for our things. Um, and I wish everybody uh, a fabulous rest of the weekend, a uh, weekend, sorry, afternoon, if only if it was the weekend, um, and evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>